All right, let's get this thing kickstarted. So uh, today I'm talking about customer lifetime value. It is literally the one KPI that every company needs to know that you need to know what the, the uh, value is that you get from your customers. All right, we'll talk more about that. Uh, this is one skill that can help you uh, achieve a $150,000 salary or more. I'll talk about that a little bit as well. This is a brand new learning lab. I've never aired this one. It's cutting edge. It's new stuff. Um, this is learning lab number 92. So we've got 92 of these things. Uh, and this is the, the 92nd one. Uh, I'm going to be focused on R today. And we're going to be also focusing on two packages that I am actually the creator of. I developed Model Time and Model Time Ensemble. We'll talk more about those as well. Uh, so I'm your host, Matt Dancho. Welcome. This is going to be a lot of fun. Well, let's dive in. All right. Um, let's see here. Come on. There we go. Goal for today. Hold the bar high, guys. 150K. I'm going to give you one skill that can make you 150K or more. That's my promise. I want you to hold that. Hold me to that. That is the bar. Does that sound fair? Let me know in chat. Give me a thumbs up or a yes or a heck yeah, if, if uh, that sounds good to you. All right, let's do it. Sweet, 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 sweet. All right, so uh, quick agenda for today, guys. So we got a bunch of new people. I'm going to cover why you should listen to me. Um, second, I'm going to give you a live code demo. That's the bulk of this training. We're going to be doing customer lifetime value in R. I have some special techniques. Uh, more on that. Third thing. The conclusion, how to make $150,000 or more with the skill. And the fourth thing, a free gift for you guys. So I want everyone leaving here with something today. All right. What is that free gift? You guys are making a very smart choice in investing some time with me today, guys. So I want to give you guys something back in return for that. Uh, this is the ultimate R cheat sheet. What it does is it consolidates the entire R ecosystem of 20,000 plus packages into the 100 best. Uh, what it really does is it saves you years. It literally took me years to figure this ecosystem out, right? Um, saves you years of trying to focus on uh, what to learn. Breaks learning those R packages down by category. So this is actually really important. Um, so things like geospatial analysis or network analysis, time series, machine learning, finance, you know, any of these domains, when you want to work in these fields, you now have the, uh, you, have, you have a cheat code. And if you're uh, big on chat GBT like I am, uh, in the age of AI, uh, it's, you know, one of the best things you can do is you can tell ChatGPT what packages to hone in on in order to give you the answers. And if you direct its responses, it'll give you better responses. All right. Um, you guys are all going to get this at the end of the presentation. Does that sound good? Give me a thumbs up. You guys like that? All right. Stick around to the end. Okay. Um, Real quick, before we dive in, this is a learning lab. What is a learning lab? It's a one hour session where I provide a full code project and we actually walk through it and you're going to be on my data science team today. We're all going to walk through it together. Uh, I'm going to show you my th thought process, what I go through, and most importantly, we're going to come up with some business insights and some actionable things that the business can do. All right. So these are case studies. Um, I now have over 90 of them. Uh, these are one hour uh, courses. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. If any of you guys want to sign up for that, um, it's up to you. Uh, definitely a smart choice if you're looking to build a portfolio, if you're looking to uh, get exposure to actual projects uh, in both R and Python. So I do them both in R and Python. Um, a little bit of background about myself, guys. In case we've never met before, I know there's some new people on here and I am delighted uh, I love uh, meeting new people, and uh, if you haven't ever heard of me before, my name is Matt Dancho, and it's a pleasure to have you on here. It really is, guys. Um, just to, you know, so you guys know 100% uh, where I'm coming from. I'm proud of my my history. My my, uh, and I, you know, I started in this field, data science, 20 in 2013, and I've been in it for over 10 years. I started with R. I still use R to this day. And uh, even though we're talking, you know, we may be talking about Python in the future or R or whatever data science coding language, my roots are in R and I love them. I'm very proud of that. Okay. Um, so I've also went on to do some pretty powerful things. Uh, first thing, I have founded my own company called Business Science. We'll talk a little bit that, about that towards the end of the presentation. Um, we're actually uh, to the packages that I've been uh, most excited, and I've actually had the opportunity to go around the world uh, speaking at conferences about these uh, time TK and model time. Uh, these are both our 
software. If you uh, have a background in art, maybe you've heard of them. Uh, show of hands. Give me a one uh, in chat if you have used Time TK or Model Time before. Uh, we're actually going to use a little bit of both of those today. All right, sweet, cool. We do have, and it's okay if you've never if you've never used it. You're actually going to get exposed to them today. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, also, uh, there. Um, so I know this presentation is about R, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Python right now. So I'm actually developing Time TK in Python, the Python version of it, and uh, I've had the pleasure of working with several people. Uh, this is Jeff Tackies. He's a senior data science manager at Kraft Heinz. This is Justin Kurland. He's the principal data scientist at Northwestern Mutual. This is Samuel Masato. He is an ML engineer at Instituto Federal. This is Lucas. Uh, he works, he's a senior analyst at HubSpot. Plamen, he's a data science consultant. And Alex Riggio uh, rounds it out. And he is a student at Georgia Tech. Question for you guys. What do these six people have in common besides working with me on some software? Anybody know? Uh, throw it in chat. Let me know what you guys think. Leo, Leo got it. He, he knows. Yeah, Douglas knows. They're all my students. These guys are my students. And I'm super proud of these individuals. And I'm super proud of all my students because these are the most elite people that are out there. They're helping me build software that's cutting edge. Uh, but also, they're having amazing careers at places like Kraft Heinz, uh, Northwestern Mutual, big Fortune 500 insurance company, um, and HubSpot and some of these other amazing companies. Uh, and the fact is, I'm actually just shy of uh, training over 20,000 people uh, over the past five, six years. And uh, my students, they're all over the world. They're doing great things. Uh, this one's uh, Ryan. He's in Toronto. This is uh, Miguel. He's in Netherlands. This one's in New Jersey. This guy, he's somewhere in the USA. Uh, and I had the opportunity to meet them at some of the conferences that I've, that I've uh, spoken at. And uh, the fact is, is that my students, they have awesome careers. Uh, and my goal is to help them become elite and the reality is, is that most of the Fortune 500 companies that you see here on this list, they employ my students. I'm proud of that. So this is what brings us here today, guys. I'm here to help you grow your career, whether you realize that or not. Uh, and I want to help you land your next job promotion or career advancement. And it all starts with data science education. Okay. And that's what brings us here. So today we are here to talk about customer lifetime value forecasting. And you may not have realized this, but this is actually going to be a time series lesson. Uh, but don't worry, guys. Uh, this is actually an amazing lesson. It is, in fact, the best data science project that I've made in 2024. So over the past two months, this is literally the best project that I've done. Um, so question, guys. Do you guys mind if I share with you the best data science project that I've done in 2024? Does that sound good? Are you guys excited about that or... Yeah, maybe. No. All right. Yeah. Carol, you know, says, yeah, thumbs up part. Okay. All right. So I got to give you some background. If I just give it to you, you guys aren't going to understand the, the importance of, of uh, what I've done here. So why is this project literally the best project that I've done here over the past two months? So I do a lot of projects, by the way. Uh, if you're new to customer lifetime value, so there's really three key factors uh, to that relate to business goals. There's one, um, how much can we spend to acquire a new customer? That's what companies want to know. So that's your lifetime value minus your cost of acquisition. And that's generally why people do this, you know, kind of back of the hand calculation that we call uh, customer lifetime value. But it actually gets more complex because when you start to drill into what customer lifetime value actually gives us, uh, you can really understand and do things like CLV segmentation. So when you know who are the most valuable customers and you can most accurately predict what those cash flows are going to be in the future, then you can start to do some pretty powerful stuff, like target those people specifically for certain things. Or if they're, uh, and the other thing is um, marketing strategy too. So think of things like churn, customer lifetime value. If they have a declining customer lifetime value, then they're at risk of churn and you need to, take actions and your business needs to take actions to uh, retain those people and uh, make them happier. So those are all things that we're going to learn how to do better today. Um, now, I got to be honest, uh, I actually did um, do customer lifetime value just one month ago, and I did it in Python. And what I found was that, you know, there's 
through that uh, research, and I've been researching this for months and months and months, that there's really four main CLV methods that people are using today. All right. There's what we call it descriptive, and then there's predictive. Uh, in the descriptive category, you have aggregation models, and those are easy, but they're you know kind of like you know back of the the napkin calculations, right? They're not going to be very accurate. Uh, something that's slightly better is a cohort model, okay? And this is this breaks people down by when they signed up with your company, so when they became a customer, um, and it groups those people into kind of buckets based on that time. Um, that's a little bit better, but really where the power comes from is the predictive models. So things like probabilistic models. So if you've ever used like the lifetime package in Python or CLV tools in R, um, and then there's, and that's uh, probabilistic, that's that's good because then you can see probabilistically um, and you can type, you can punch in, you know, how long we want to evaluate the customer lifetime value for and it'll give you a probability, all right? Or it'll give you an estimated spending that they're going to um, uh have with your company. And then what I focused on in lab 91, which was the last lab, is the machine learning. And this is the, you know, kind of top of the top. This is the most advanced. Um, so it's a little tougher for beginners to implement it, but it's the quote unquote best that's out there, right? Because we can like actually make machine learning models that predict over the next 90 days, you know, using tools like XG Boost, right? So, uh, but it turns out though, and I didn't realize this until, until I started doing a lot more research just over the past month. And I stumbled onto a fifth approach. And I'm going to share that with you today. So here's what this fifth approach does. So remember, guys, I did that. I did this Python lab uh, 91. You know, the students loved it. They said it was amazing. You know, it was awesome. But the reality was, is when I did this lab, and you can see the results of our uh, tenfold cross validation, we have this thing called mean absolute error. Now, do you guys know what mean absolute error is? Anybody know what that is? MAE? Have you guys ever heard of it? Give me a thumbs up or you know what it is. Somebody can just type one line. Yeah, it's so what it is, is an error metric. And you want to try and reduce it. And, and it's on average, it's how much your predictions are off. Okay. So for a 90 day customer lifetime value on average, that in that first fold, this is 247. So it was off by $247. Uh, okay. In the 90 day spend for that for uh, on average per customer. Okay. And then in this third fold, so what we do is we take the average, the overall average of all 10 folds. And that overall average is 212. So on average, this model is off by 212 units, okay? Well, what we're going to discuss today is going to shrink that down to 137. So imagine if your company, which depends on customer lifetime value and wants to know what the future cash flows are going to be of those customers, and you have just shrunk the error from 212 units on average down to 137. That's pretty freaking incredible. And that can save your company a lot of money, all right? So I'm gonna show you how to do that today, all right? Now, uh, imagine though what this is gonna do for you. So just think like, you know, what's something that you might be interested in doing right now with a project like this? Maybe putting it in your portfolio? That'd be pretty fantastic. So imagine having that as your, you know, leading portfolio project. You might be able to get jobs with it. You might be able to do, uh, get a promotion if you implement it in your company. And that's the power of what you're learning today. All right, guys. So who's ready for a demo? Give me a thumbs up. Give me a one. Give me a yes. A heck yeah. Let's do it. Okay. All right. All right. I'm ready for a demo too. I uh, Literally, I spent two days putting all this code together. So today, guys, we're talking about customer lifetime value forecasting, the fifth method that no one knows how to do. But I figured it out and I'm sharing that with you guys today. Um, so uh, I love to have business case studies and let's think of ourselves as we all are working on the same data science team together. So we have 320 participants right now on live with us and we'll probably have by the end of this maybe 400 or so as, as people trickle in. So uh, just imagine we're all on the same data science team though. We're all working together. Uh, we work for this company here, Whole Foods Market. They're a big grocery store. Uh, it's a retail business case, and we're in charge of doing the marketing analytics and the customer analytics for them. Okay, so that is the preface. Um, this is our project today. So for my Learning Labs Pro members, we're going to be working out of this 01 CLV forecasting. 
And keep in mind, this is the fifth method. Now in lab 91, I went through the first four methods. So I figured I might as well do the same thing in R. So as a bonus for my Learning Lab Pro members, so anybody who takes me up on joining Learning Labs Pro today, uh, you're gonna get this as a bonus. Now I'm not gonna go through all of this because this is massive. It's uh, 433 lines of additional code that you're not going to see, that I'm not gonna go through today. But um, one of the really cool things is uh, we're uh, in this bonus, we use this thing called H2O. And uh, just with H2O, I was able to get the um, mean absolute error down to 171 using the same tactics that we used last week, but now just switching it up with H2O. So right there, that's a 24% increase um, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, versus the lab 91 methodology that we used. Okay. Now, uh, and, I, and that bonus, it does cover the first four methods and shows you how to do an R, um, shows you how to do the aggregate method, the cohort method, the, um, oh, I haven't written here, <laughs> don't got to go by memory, the probabilistic method and the predictive method, okay? So these four methods are all covered in that bonus, okay? Now, what we're focused on today, though, is this CLV forecasting with model time. So we're going to be focusing on my model time package. It's something that I built to do high scale forecasts. All right. So uh, our business goal today, what we want to do is we want to improve the predictions of our customer lifetime value, because now that we know kind of, you know, a, a rough estimate of what the customer lifetime is from the last lab. Now, what we want to do is we want to try and improve that. So we're more accurately measure measuring the future cash flows so we can do things like figure out exactly how much money we should be spending on advertising to acquire new customers. Um, and we can also do things like the segmentations that I had talked about, where we want to focus on the top customers and the bottom customers and the middle customers. And we want to figure out how to segment them based on their uh, projected lifetime values. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do, the strategy we're going to implement uh, uses this thing called global modeling, and that's a forecasting approach. So we just make one model that is going to uh, be able to predict uh, hundreds and hundreds of customers. Now, we're going to actually focus in on 100 customers today, but you can actually um, increase the scale up to you know, 5,000, 10,000. Uh, usually at that limit, you need to start doing batches at a certain point. But what I'm going to show you today, um, you can basically scale it up and then you just um, do batches once you, once you hit to uh, a certain limit. So anyways, um, Goal today, uh, we're going to do global modeling. Uh, we're going to make 100 forecasts. Uh, this is covered in depth in my five course R track program. Um, and if you want to know specifically where it's covered, it's in the third course, high performance time series. Global modeling and ensembles are covered in modules 13 through 15. Okay. All right. Um, some libraries that we're going to be using today. So uh, I am using the development version of model time, it's not yet on CRAN. Uh, so I'm going to load that in. That's the forecasting library, model time ensemble, uh, and time TK. And again, these are three packages that I've personally written. I've developed these uh, to do exactly what we're going to be covering today, high scale forecasting. Um, they leverage a, another package called tidy models. Now, have you guys ever heard of tidy models? Put a one in chat if you've heard of tidy models. What What is tidy models? Uh, can, can somebody tell me, you know, just real quickly, one sentence, what is tidy models? I'll, I'll give you my explanation. If you're familiar with Python, I'll give you my ex explanation. So I think of tidy models, like I think of scikit-learn, but it's a lot easier to use. Uh, so yeah, it's R scikit-learn. So Carolina has it. Yeah, it's basically, and Leo has it. It's a suite of packages that all work together for, for uh, machine learning. So we're going to show off some of that stuff. And we're going to show how model time uses tidy models. All right. And then we're also going to be using... Um, the uh, tidyverse and uh, janitor, these are kind of tidyverse is like the core data analysis library and visualization. So we're, um, it contains a bunch of packages and it loads them all up for you, like dplyr, ggplot2, et cetera. And that's how that's how we're going to do our data analysis. Janitor, um, janitor, we really only use in one spot. Actually, I don't even know if I use it in this um, in this lesson. So you can just forget about we'll set janitor aside for now. All right, I'm going to load in the uh, data. So we're working with uh, transactions and we're actually working with a lot of transactions. So let me uh, show you what this looks like. It's loading it in. Uh, it'll take a second. So hopefully we can get it loaded in. There it goes. 
And what's it look like? Transactions process. There it goes. So yeah, this is a lot of data. It's two point uh, two point six million rows by twenty three columns. It's a it's a fairly large data set. Um, in my folder here, it's in this data folder. So uh, it's six hundred and forty three point seven megabit bytes. So basically half a gigabyte, over a little over half a gig. Uh, pretty pretty large data set. Um, so the way it works is <clears throat> you've got these household keys, and for that grocery store. Whole Foods, they have a household, which is basically their customer identifier that they're tracking. And each basket has a basket ID. So the basket is that day when that customer shops with, with Whole Foods and they buy a bunch of stuff. So they're going to be buying product, this product, this product, this product, this, and they're purchasing at this store location, this store location, this store location. This is when they bought, this is when they bought, this is when they bought. And you can see the, the quantity and the sales value and so on. All right. Um, those are pretty much what we're going to be using today. It's got a, a bunch of other stuff in there, but we're going to set that aside and just kind of disregard that for now, because really what we want to do is we want to model this as um, sales transactions. And that's the basic, basic, basic stuff right here is just the, uh, the information that's in these columns here. OK, so the first thing that we need to do is we actually have to prepare this as a, for a time series analysis. So what we wanna do, and this will take a little bit of time to run um, because I'm doing some group-wise calculations on 2.5 million rows of data. So it's running right now, but I'll explain what it's doing. So we're just selecting the columns that we need. Um, and there's kind of like three different steps here. So we're gonna summarize it by time um, or, or summarize it uh, by household key, basket ID and timestamp. And we're just going to um, get the total value uh, by basket, all right? Um, and then we're going to ungroup it. And then we're going to add some time series features um, some uh, uh, based on the timestamp that that uh, customer purchased. And then we're going to add in one more feature here, uh, so the date diff. And this is basically the difference in, in days between purchases. So this will give us enough information to just kind of like, you know, do a little bit of exploratory data analysis. All right. So now um, the data set is only 276,000 rows, but we have it aggregated by basket. Okay. So we have the household. Um, so this, this would be one of those basket IDs kind of compressing, um, getting the total amount of sales that that customer spent, uh, giving it the date and time that they spent it on, uh, what day of the week they spent, what day of the month, what hour of the day, what minute of the day, um, the, the, the actual date, which is just the, the date portion here. And then also the difference between, you know, how long it took. So from this purchase to this purchase, the customer took 16 days to, to, to visit Whole Foods again. All right. And then from this purchase to this purchase, it was 21 days. And then you see it comes back to like a more of a weekly standpoint. So there's a lot of information we can glean now that, that we have it prepared, um, uh, basically aggregate it by basket. Okay. All right. The next thing we need to do is we need to start thinking in terms of time series. So it's still not really a time series yet. What we want to do is we want to model it as, you know, different spikes when that person, when that purchase is, is uh, uh, when that per person or household is, uh, is purchasing. So we're going to do a little bit more data wrangling here. Uh, I'm going to grab the max date out of the system. Um, so that's the max date in this uh, is, so the, the most recent date it was from 2018, 12, 14. Okay. And we're just going to take that, um, that sales data here that we have aggregated. And now we're going to convert it into a time series. Um, so we're going to use pad by time in here. That's a time TK function. Um, and we're just going to uh, formulate this. So let me run this line. Um, and it's basically going to summarize the sales value for us. Okay. So we're grouping by household key, we're padding, and then we're ungrouping. And then what we're doing is uh, we're, we're calculating um, a sales value. If uh, the sales value is, uh, if it's NA, we're replacing those with zero, basically. So now, and this, this is what I mean by padding. So we're padding this data set. So we now have a complete time series. So all the days, the dates in between when that customer is making purchases, we're now filling with zeros, okay? So what this allows us to do is then move into kind of a time series analysis. And we're able to kind of see what those sales patterns actually look like with, you know, the time between each of those purchases being also um, included. 
So I'm going to use a function here called plot time series. And in my process, my data science process, usually what I like to do is when, I, when I'm getting familiar with a new data set, I usually do exploratory data analysis. And I'm just trying to look to understand what's, what's happening. So let me run this. Um, it'll take a second to run. I'm gonna use this cool uh, functionality called Trelliscope. Um, but what we're doing here is I'm just taking the first 10 households um, and I'm going to group them by their household key and I'm gonna plot them. Um, and this is what I, I normally do with big data. I don't try and plot everything, but I try and plot just a couple of the customers and just to see what's going on, all right? So this is what uh, purchase history uh, looks like for customer one. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of small here. Let me um, expand this a little bit to see. Yeah, there we go. So this is customer one and you can see we have these spikes. So uh, this, this customer spent uh, $123 at Whole Foods, right? On, uh, uh, it looks like August 14th of 2017. And then, but you see, can see the overall trend Trends is st staying kind of flat, all right? Uh, then you have customers like this where the, the trend, it looks like they slowed down in their purchases here in, at the beginning of 2018, but then they kind of are picking some stuff back up, but uh, it, it's kind of spotty, right? So that's another type of buying pattern. And then this one, this is where we're kind of getting closer to what I call churn. So for these companies where you've got a customer that's spending a lot with you, and then sometimes they, they kind of teeter out a little bit. They start spending less with you, and less and less. So maybe there's another grocery store that they're going to. Uh, and this fr uh, frequency of purchases start to uh, spread out. So between these two purchases, it's over a month between these two. Whereas back here, it was, you know, uh, basically like a week between purchases. Okay. So that's, that's something that, with time series analysis, we can actually track that. Um, and, and so on, and the same type of thing here, you can see back here, they were spending a lot and now they're spending a lot less with us. Okay, so the idea here is, one of the things we might wanna do is try and catch that before it happens. And we wanna try and preserve those customers and retain those customers and get them spending more with us, okay? Um, this customer, I mean, they're, they're spending a ton. We love this, so you wanna, you wanna keep that up. Um, this one's actually got increase, increasing rates. So this is, uh, great too, because, you know, maybe back here, they didn't realize something about Whole Foods, but now they found what they like to, to uh, shop there for, and they're starting to do more of it um, and so on. So it's really valuable to be able to do this thing. This is called a Trelloscope uh, plot. And it's something that um, just when I do time series analysis, I, I normally dive into a, uh, a Trelloscope. All right. So um, that's a little bit about uh, what the data set looks like. Now that we have some information on this, um, what I wanna do is we're gonna dive into uh, customer lifetime value forecasting. And you know, this is a little bit of an advanced analysis. So how many of you guys are beginners? Are you, put, a, put a one in chat if you're a beginner, if you're a complete beginner or if you're early on in your data science journey. Okay, good, 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 good. All right, so this is gonna feel a little bit kind of scary, all right? But I want, to, I want you guys to take this and just understand that this is a pretty advanced analysis that we're going to go through, but it's still really good for you to be exposed to this. Why? Because you're going to hear my thought process as I'm going through and doing this analysis, and you're going to get to see some of the decisions that I'm making, and that's going to be very valuable to you as you grow in this field, okay? So don't get scared and don't, don't tune me out when I say something that doesn't make any sense, you know, and feel free to ask questions too. So that's, that's the other thing. we got a lot of people on the call here. Put a, put a two in chat if you if you you know expert. I know like we got the Leo Timmermans, we got uh, some other folks on here. If you're if you're pretty advanced, yeah. So we got advanced people on here too that can help you out. All right. Okay, so we're gonna dive into it. Um, I call this a monthly CLV forecasting. So right now this is uh, basically daily data. So we have aggregated it and we've filled in the the time gaps with zero. Uh, but every timestamp, so you can see they're all, all the days of the month are being recorded in here. Okay. So, uh, one of the challenges with intermittent demand is that unless you have, um, an event that creates the spike that you, um, can model, you can include that in your, um, in your analysis, or if it happens like on every, sa the same day of every week. But the problem with customers is, you know, sometimes they shop on a Tuesday, sometimes they shop on a Wednesday, sometimes, you know, but oftentimes it just depends when they don't have food in their growth, you know, in their, in their refrigerator at home. I know that's how I am, right? You know, oh man, I'm out of apples today. Crap, got to go to the store. 
So um, it, you know, it's tough to predict that. Uh, so what we can do uh, when we measure the CLVs, instead of trying to measure it on a daily and, and then having like really high error, what we can actually do um, is we can aggregate it to like um, a higher frequency or a lower frequency, I guess, but aggregate it to like um, a weekly frequency or a monthly. And then that becomes much easier to predict. Okay. Because generally speaking, they're spending, you know, um, consistently month to month. Okay. And we'll see that. So uh, aggregation to monthly actually increases the ac accuracy of our models. And you can try this too. I, I encourage you guys, you know, try it daily, uh, but then also try it monthly and you'll see how much uh, more accurate the monthly model is. So we're going to uh, forecast 100 households. So we're just going to take 100 of these households, um, I'm just the first 100. And that's the reason I'm doing that is because I don't want you guys to just sit here and like wait for you know things to compute. I want to have this be you know kind of snappy. Um, but you can increase this to more than 100 households. All right. So um, I'm taking a making a subset here, grabbing the first 100 households. Um, I'm going to use this function called summarize by time, then to um, aggregate to a one month frequency. All right. So now when I do that, so I've taken the subset now and you can see each of these timestamps has now um, just basically summed up the sales in each month for that specific household. Okay. So you can see it's only one, you know, even though it's a full date, um, all of the dates in between have been uh, dropped now. And this is now the total sales for that month. Okay. And it's just going to be a lot easier to forecast that. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do. All right. So this is my outline here. Um, I'm, I'm in uh, the data preparation. So we're getting ready to kind of jump into modeling. And what we want to do is we actually want to incorporate some features into this uh, modeling approach. So um, we're going to do kind of two things here. We're first going to extend the time series into the future um, by the uh, the three months that we want to spend. So we want to uh, calculate the CLV for the next 90 days. Um, and we're going to use future frame to then ex uh, increase the length of each time series in here by three. So I'm actually going to run this. This this one does take a, um, a minute to run just because uh, we're doing some rolling features too. So this is going to add in then some some lags and some rolling features so some that are based on the lags. So we're going to take our sales value. We're going to add in some lags. Um, and a, a lag is just taking the sales data and basically shifting it up three units. So that way um, we get kind of some what are called autoregressive properties into the model. All right. So, um, oh, a good question here. Sang has, um, how did you decide on the lagging parameters? So th the way I decided, I, I always want to include, since I know I'm forecasting three months, I have, uh, I can put a three month lag in there and that'll fill in the next three data points. Okay. And then I usually then double the frequency and I might do like a three month lag and a six month lag. But if you start doing 12 months, you're going to get um, too much missing data. And that's going to take away, uh, because we only have so many months here. Um, we only have maybe like 24 months. So if you take out 12 months of data um, by doing the shift, you're going to lose a lot of good information. All right. So that's that's kind of why I did three and six. So that's a good question. And then the Slideify, what this does is take a moving average of those lags. So it basically smooths out the lags um, on a, a two month window, uh, two month average, a three month average and a six month average. Um, and you set partial equals true to, to fill in any missing gaps, any NAs, um, and uh, it's really powerful. So this is what the data set looks like now. Um, we now have some, uh, our identifier, our date time feature, and then um, our sales value, which is the target. That's what we want to forecast. And then we have some features in here, uh, and there's a couple other ones. I'll, I'll do glimpse so you guys can see all of the features. But basically, uh, we've got the lag three, lag six, and then the lag six, roll two, roll three, roll six. Okay, so that smoothed out lag feature. Um, okay, and you're probably wondering, how did I know to do this? Well, I studied a lot of time series. And actually, in the M5 competition, this is was some of the techniques that they used. And it actually panned out to be really, really good, really, really powerful. Um, okay, um, and then if we check out the last, the, the tail of, of the data... So um, keep in mind that you're going to have some three NAs, and this is because we've extended that data set from uh, for each of the time series that are in here 
three units. So that's three months. So if you add these up, that's basically 90 days. Okay. And you can see everything's filled in though. There should not be any NAs in here. Okay. All right. So now that you understand the data preparation process, let's move on to the actual, we're moving into the machine learning. So this is going to be um, part uh, 4.0. We're going to split the data and then uh, prepare it for global modeling. So um, I'm going to create this thing called future data. And that's what, um, at the end of this lesson, when we do the forecast down here in section nine, that's when we're going to use the future data. So we're going to kind of set that aside for a little bit. Um, but that's basically all of the, the data with missing values in the, in the uh, sales value. Um, so like household three has, uh, household one has three months, household two has three months. And this is the for, the final forecast that we're going to make for the next three months of cash flows. Okay. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to create the actual data. And that's just, this is the data that we're going to split up on training and testing and prepare that for uh, the modeling. Okay. Um, then we're going to, so this is the actual data. So we set the future data aside. That's what we're going to, that's the, the business insights are going to come from the future data, but the modeling and, and getting the best model that we can is going to come from this actual data. So we need to split that up. Um, we're going to do what's called a time series split. Uh, I'm going to assess three months and I'm going to set cumulative true, which just basically tells this time series split function to use all of the previous data for the model. Okay. So now um, if you look at my splits, uh, so this is 1428 rows. Uh, we have a total of 1428, but 300 of those rows are gonna be in our test data and uh, 1,128 are gonna be in our training data, all right? And because I did a time series split, um, it's all consecutive data. It didn't like randomly split them, okay? All right. So now we've got the splits ready. We're ready to start doing what's called global modeling. Um, again, this is going to be a little this is going to be a little advanced, but this is good exposure, especially if you've never seen time series before, especially if you're you know marketing person um, that is beginning in data science. This is going to be good for you guys. So um, how we do global models is we basically take the training data set. So my splits. Remember here, uh, this has. 1,128 that are in our training set. And then it's identified the 300 uh, most recent observations that are going to be in our testing data set. All right. So we're going to take our training data set. So if I run training on splits, it just pulls out that 1,128. Okay. And we're going to use this in order to create what's called a pre-processor. So every machine learning model um, once you actually train the model, it takes two components. It takes a model specification, meaning the set of parameters that you're going to use and the, and the type of model that you're going to use. And then it takes the data, uh, which is usually processed and it use, uses a preprocessor to process that. Okay. So when you combine those, that's what's going to combine into a workflow. All right. So we're going to do some special things to this data set to really extract out as much value as possible. Okay. So we're going to use this step time series signature. Um, we're going to remove the date because machine learning models, they don't do well with date features, but they do well with features that are numeric that are extracted from those date features. Okay. Um, we're going to convert household key to a factor. Um, and that's just because this is an ID feature uh, and I want it to be stored as a factor. And then um, once it's stored as a factor, I'm going to do what's called one hot encoding. And what that's going to do is it's going to take all of the categorical data in here and it's going to convert those into dummy features or one, one hot encoded features. So I'll explain, I'll show you what this does. Um, when I applied this recipe, um, that's what this line of code does here. So we took uh, all of those columns. Um, so remember it had the sales value. We got rid of the date column. Um, we still got the these these features in here that we feature engineered. We've got the target column. Um, and then now we've got a bunch of these date features. The, so these all came from that time series signature. Uh, it basically extracted out from the date feature, this thing, this column here. It extracted out all of these columns here. So we now got 28 more columns that we didn't have before all from that one date feature. And then we, and then I dropped the date feature. So that's what, that's what I did up here when I, when you see that step remove date. Okay. Uh, when I did the one hot encoding, that's where it took all of these households and it broke them up into different features. And you can see household, uh, which, which is it? this. So X seven uh, has a one here. Okay. That means this first observation 
uh, is the um, household key seven, number seven. So household number seven uh, in, in the data set. Um, and then there's a couple other date features. This is again from the time series signature, but then it got dummied uh, by that one hot encoding process. So you can see zeros and ones. So month label nine, um, this is, this is uh, the ninth month. So probably October. Um, and this one, uh, these observations are all on the sixth day. So that's what that means. Okay. So you can see we've got now tons and tons of data for us to do machine learning on, and it's all numeric data, which is what machine learning algorithms like. All right. So with that, we now have our preprocessor, but we still have to create the specification. So that's the second part of every machine learning model. So we're first going to create an XG boost model. Uh, I'm setting the mode to regression. You can either pick regression or classification. And then um, I'm setting the learning rate. So this is one of the hyperparameters. I'm setting it to 0 0.1. Okay. This, uh, running this creates a model. But that model has not been trained yet. So we need to train it. And remember that machine learning model, in order to do the training or the fitting, you need both a model and a preprocessor. So we're doing that here. We're going to take a, a blank workflow, and this is where tidy models is really nice. Uh, we're going to add a model specification to it. So that's adding this boosted tree model specification. Then we're going to add a recipe to it, and then we're going to train it, fit it on the training data. And that's what our workflow is going to be here. Okay. And bada bing, bada boom, it's already done. Okay. Very fast. Um, and now we've, we've got a model that can, we, we can actually convert into a forecaster and that's where model time is going to come into play, uh, here in the next section, section six. So we're in section five right now. Um, the beauty is, is that once you get that process, you can apply it very quickly to a lot of different, um, modeling approaches. So this is GLM net. Have you guys ever heard of GLM net? Um, anybody know what GLM net is? Put a one, one in chat. Okay. So GLM net um, is a linear model. And I like to include in my time series, when I do time series, I have a method to my madness. So XGBoost is going to be my best tree-based model. So XGBoost is like a decision tree on steroids, right? Well, um, I don't want to just include a bunch of tree-based models into this. And you're going to see why here in a little bit. Um, but now I want to use my best linear model. So it's a completely different model. Um, and it has a penalty feature in here. I can penalize it. Uh, and, and what it, what it's going to do is what's called re regularized regression. But it, what it really does is it gives me a different way of viewing uh, and modeling this data that's in a more linear fashion. Okay. So uh, we're going to use the same recipe spec. Um, we're just creating a new, uh, a new modeling type. So we start with a blank workflow, add the model, add the recipe. And but yeah, I, again, very straightforward. And that's why it's so easy to use tiny models. Um, and we now have an elastic net model in here. Okay. Um, okay. These are going to be a little, um, so these, if you're not familiar with time series, then this type of model may not make sense, but it's really a super duper simple model. So uh, this workflow win median three, um, I'm going to use this function called uh, window regression, and I'm actually going to use a different a different recipe. I'm just going to set the sales value as a function of, you know, the other features that are in this um, training data set. Okay, so so all that is is uh, let's do this control enter. Um, so sales value as a function of all this other stuff. Okay, but what we're going to key in on is the sales value, and what window re regression does is it just takes whatever our window size, it'll take the last three observations and it'll apply this function to it, a median. So it's basically taking the median of the last three observation. And then we're just going to carry that forward as a straight line. The reason this works, and this is like a super duper simple model, but it's surprisingly effective. Okay. And it's super scalable too. Um, so we're going to add a uh, workflow win median three, and then we're going to do the same thing, but just adjust this window size. Uh, and we're going to do a six month as well. Okay. So now we have four different models. We have one XG boost model right here. We've got one GLM net model here, and we've got a window uh, median three and a window median six model here. Okay. And what this does is it gives me different views of the problem. So this is going to give me a more complicated view with a tree-based model. This is going to be, give me a complicated view with a linear model. 
Um, this is going to give me a simple view with a three month um, median model. And this is gonna give me another sim simple view, but but slightly different with, a, with taking a little bit more data, six months of data into account, okay? So we're gonna do um, what's called the model time workflow. And so what model time does is it, it's kind of like a layer on top of tidy models. So once you have some tidy models developed, you can put it into this model time table and it really just kind of organizes it for us. Um, but it allows us to walk through a forecasting workflow. Um, so the, the forecasting workflow starts with this concept called calibration. All right. And what we do when we calibrate is we take our testing data now and we basically apply these models that have been trained on our training data set uh, to forecast against our testing data. All right. So, uh, and what that's going to do is in our model timetable, it's going to add a couple of new columns and it's going to have that calibration data in here. Now I did this by ID. So we're actually tracking the time series ID as well. And that's going to be very important because a lot of times we want to know not only aggregated metrics and of, of time series performance, but we want to know basically by time series, how well are each models performing? Okay. So, um, we now have our model calibrated and then we can move on. And the next thing I normally do is I start to take a look at the uh, accuracy metrics. So this is a global model. So uh, by default, we're going to, and I'm, if I do accuracy by ID false, that's going to give us a global accuracy. Um, and then uh, you can see here that we now have overall, um, we can see here, and, and this is a mean absolute error. So we'll just focus in on MAE, um, for this uh, particular approach. So you can see they're all kind of around the same, but our best model is has the lowest MAE um, and it has a 77 unit mean absolute error. And keep in mind that's 77 per observation. So on, on uh, you know, each point tends to be off about 77 um, uh, units. Okay. So uh, we can see here that the, the simple one, the window function six, the median, is given us actually the best uh, mean absolute error. Uh, the next one, the next best one is our XG boost model, then our GLM net, and then window uh, function three. Um, so this, the three month median is giving us uh, a little bit higher. But the cool thing is, and we're gonna find out how to combine these models to get the strengths of all three of them or all four of them, okay? All right, um, a lot of times too, what we wanna do, like I said, um, it, when we have an ID feature here is uh, we want to look into by each customer ID, you know, how each model did. So this particular, this first uh, customer household one, um, this one uh, looks like the window function three did the best. Uh, this one though, it looks like XGBoost did the best. And you're gonna see this a lot that certain models, you know, it's not, even though overall the window function six did the best overall, but a lot of times, you know, when you dive into each of the time series, you know, certain, you know, that model um, isn't performing the best on every single time series. In fact, it's very rare that you just get one model that performs the best on all of the time series. Um, okay. And then what I'm going to do is uh, move on to the forecast visualization. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that uh, calibration data. And what I'm gonna do, th this just uh, model time forecast allows me to visualize it. And it also uh, allows me to add the confidence intervals to it. So um, one, one thing that's really big in time series nowadays, have you guys ever heard of uh, conformal uh, prediction or conformal inference? Um, have, have you guys heard of that? Okay, so Carolina hasn't, Marcel has. It's kind of a newer concept, but it's this idea that um, what we want to be able to do is take our confidence, um, and, and really make a, a confidence prediction through our time series models that isn't based on like training data, but is, is more grounded in what's called, um, more of like a machine learning style approach where we can actually generate a confidence interval around our predictions. Okay. So you get confidence, low confidence, high. Now this is going to show NA because this is the actual data. So if I did not include actual data here, um, this these, these NAs would be gone. It would just have the predictions. But because I'm including actual data, um, that's going to allow me to visualize the forecast. So again, I'm just going to look at the first 10 households. Uh, we're going to use this function called plot model time forecast, and we're going to use H uh, Trello scope again. So it takes a second to run. 
but it'll give us this interactive visualization tool. Okay. So hopefully that wraps up here in just a second. Oh, you got to be kidding me. It didn't like that. Yeah. So I think when, sometimes when I resize the screen, um, so just bear with me a second, guys. Hold hold that thought. We were on line 242. So I will get back here super fast. I got to trick up my sleeve. So we're going to do control enter. Control enter. We're going to skip this. This is just that trellis scope. We'll do this one here. Control enter. Control enter. This is this is always the fun with live coding, guys. When something when something uh, you know go, goes a little bit off, but we'll get back there. Don't worry, guys. I got you. I got you guys covered here. Okay, we're gonna run through all of these models again. Boom. Okay, this this is the last one that takes a while. Uh, all the other ones take uh, are, are pretty fast. So, okay, let's do this. We'll run this too. Grab a drink of coffee. There it goes. And we're almost back in business. We just need this one here. And um, I'm going to skip this visualization. I just don't, because it consumes some memory. Um, uh, what I'll do is uh, we'll, we'll skip that for, for now. So let's see. The sales uh, house by time extended. Yeah, this is the last time. Uh, this is the last expensive operation. Okay. All right. So just pretend like I showed you this amazing forecast visualization you just got a ton of value so get so can you guys like cheer for me give me some thumbs up or something like to pretend like i just showed you this without running into an error that caused my r session to abort all right there we go yeah it was awesome wasn't it yeah okay all right well we'll we'll just pretend that we saw this visualization but honestly this next stuff is really what's the uh the the secret sauce the power so now what we're going to do is, uh, if we remember here, uh, we've got the model time accuracy, okay? So the accuracy is really what we're trying to um, trying to hone in on, okay? So these this MAE, um, what we want to do is we want to convert that to a 90-day mean absolute error or a 90-day root mean squared error. And that's what is going to allow me to compare it to lab 91, and also the bonus here, um, the, the H2O uh, machine learning model that I did down here um, in the bonus, this H2O model, it's going to allow me to compare it to that, okay? So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little data wrangling. I'm going to take my test forecast that looks like this. We're going to filter out where um, we have the actual data because we don't need that in here. So, so we're going to remove that data. Now we just have the model predictions for the for the four different models here, okay? And we have all of the predictions on our test set now. We're gonna group by model ID and household key, and then we're gonna summarize and create the, uh, it's just basically gonna add up those three months of data. So um, it's gonna add out all that stuff up, and we're gonna save that as this total uh, customer lifetime value prediction. So you can see here, model ID one uh, for household one uh, is predicting 442, and the actual was 570. Okay, for those for that three month prediction time frame. All right. And this is going to be mind blowing, guys. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the mean absolute error. And I can see, holy crap. So that first model on average is getting 137 mean absolute error. Remember, guys, this is what I got in the uh, lab 91, 212 on average. So we are crushing that. Okay. Um, we can do the same thing with RMSE. So RMSE, that first model is about 200. Uh, we can see over here, the RMSE is right here, 438, 300, 346. So that the average RMSE is, you know, well above 200, 200 250, something like that, maybe 300. Um, so we are getting, you know, much better RMSE. 
by taking this forecasting approach. So CLV forecasting is the real deal, guys. Um, I'm not just showing you like some cool technique because I think it's fancy. Uh, like this is what I got what I got so excited about. So yeah, I, I compared it then uh, my uh, machine learning prediction to Lab 91 and Lab 92, uh, and the Python model had an RMSE of about 400. The uh, H2O model had an RMS RMSE of 261, and even just with our first modeling pass, we already got down to 200. So that's exciting. All right, you guys, guys, see, give me, give me a, you know, give me some thumbs up. It, uh, you know, isn't, isn't that amazing? All right, all right. So here's another way though. So what I decided to do was take that CLV prediction. And what I want to do is I want to assess my, uh, my prediction quality. So there's a way we can do that, a very simple way we can do that. Um, so what this does here is it draws lines, um, these smoothing lines um, using an, uh, a linear smoother, and it plots all of the predictions, the actuals versus the predictions for each of the four different models. So model ID one, which was XGBoost, two, which was GLMNet, three, which was the uh, three month median and, and four, which was the six month median. All right, so I do see an issue right here. Um, so the uh, what I'm seeing here, remember how like, if we just go by this metric up here, we're gonna see like RMSE is awesome, that's great. But we're seeing that it's a little high down here and it's a little low up here, or it's, or it's uh, actual is, is lower the or uh, actual is greater than the prediction here and prediction is greater than the actual down here. Okay. But overall you, you want to be as close to this uh, 45 degree line as possible. Okay. Um, and we can see that each one of these models kind of has like different things. Like this one may not have been as accurate overall, but it's much closer to that 45 degree line. And we like that. So what uh, I'm thinking now, and this is, you know, really powerful what if we combine these what if we instead of just going by like a best picking a best model and running with it which is what most data science teams do what if we actually combine these results and take the best of both worlds and we could create like kind of like a super model all right and i'm not talking about Halle berry i'm talking about a machine learning model that is going to be really really powerful okay all right so uh section eight is uh where we're going to do just that okay so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take that calibration data and that's these four models here. And I'm going to use these as what are called sub models. All right. And I'm going to do what's called a weighted ensemble. And I encourage you guys to uh, to, to toy around with these uh, weightings. But I'm just doing basically a, a, a basic average, you know, and a lot of times if you toy around with these weightings. So we're going to take 25 percent of each model and we're going to create that super model off of that. OK. Um, so, uh, the next thing is once we do that, we can add the mod, um, then what we want to do is we want to compare the, uh, ensemble to the rest of the models. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm actually adding this ensemble model, um, to right here to this data and I'm calibrating it. Okay. The reason I want to do that again, a lot of this is, is basically the same stuff that we, we saw already just kind of rehashed out. I want to compare these models and I can see here. Holy cow, my mean absolute error just dropped down more, 74 overall, okay? Um, just by taking the average of these models, these submodels, okay? Um, and then we can check out if we want to do by the um, each of the different, you know, households, each of those time series, we can see this one, you know, it's not going to be the best overall. So this uh, this one, it looks like it's actually the fourth best for, for this first household, but as you scroll down here, you're going to see overall, it does pretty well. This this time, it's um, the third best for that one. This time, it's the best overall for, for this third household and so on. Okay. And that's what we like to see. We, we're seeing some improvements. Okay. Um, but really, what's powerful is if we do this forecast again, and we do this summarization of the 90-day, uh, we can see the overall metrics here. So uh, give us a second to run. We can see it's now matching that XG boost model. So ideally, you'd want to see it improve, but it's not that big of a deal. What I actually care about is this prediction quality, because that's that's the problem we had with the XG boost model. And that's why we wanted to fix it. So uh, this is this is the this is going to blow your mind, guys. All right. So this fifth model now. It's just as powerful overall as the XG boost model was. But look how close it is to that line. 
And that is the power of Ensemble. All right. Because our predictions are now right on track and it's a much better model that is going to be more stable. Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. All right. There we go. Now you guys are getting it. All right. The last step, and we're we're uh, we're almost there, guys. So I appreciate you guys just hanging hanging in there with me. Um, what we're doing here is I'm going to take that fifth model, and I'm and I'm doing what's called refitting. So I just have the model ID five. This is the one I want to take into production. I've now refit it on the entire data set. Uh, all um, so we're doing the the whole actual data, and this is where that future data set comes back in. So now we're going to do the future forecast. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll do the visualization. This does take a little bit of resources here. Um, so I'll, I'll say that for last. I don't wanna, I don't wanna blow up my computer. Uh, one of the cool things though, so we're gonna make the future forecast. And um, what we can do here is we can actually examine that future forecast. Um, before I do that though, uh, one of the big things that you might be interested in is getting feature importance. This is another hot topic, uh, explainable machine learning. Uh, we can get the feature importance of, of the XGBoost model. So this isn't the, uh, so we can see which features are actually um, really helping out that XGBoost model that performed well. It's the sales value lag six, roll six. It's getting a 57% gain is coming from that. So that's where the vast majority, um, the, the second best feature is the sales value lag three. And then um, some of these other features kind of round out the rest, but like that model is getting most of its information from those first two features. So that tells you that you're doing a good job feature engineering uh, and it really improved that model's performance. Business impact. Again, this is, this is what it's all about, guys. So at the end of the day, it's nice to have a fancy model, be able to predict and increase the accuracy, but what does that do for my company? So we've just increased the accuracy of our 90-day CLV for, um, by about 50% over that Python model that I did a, uh, a month ago, all right? But what we also know is we know who's gonna spend more and who's gonna be at risk of churn. How do we know what that is? Well, we just take our future forecast, that 90 day forecast and we rank them. So what I'm doing here is basically ranking the total spend over the next 90 days. And if I take the first 10 customers, these are the ones that are gonna be spending the most with us. If I take the last 10, these are the ones that are gonna be spending the least. That's, those are the ones that you gotta be worried about churn, uh, churning, okay? All right. Um, we'll, we'll dive into con uh, conclusions here in a second. I do want to show you the forecast. Everybody loves seeing a forecast visualization. I know I do, um, but this, this proves my point. This will, this will show you what that ensemble model can do. Um, hopefully I'm not going to touch this, the screen. Hopefully it doesn't cause my R session to abort. If it does, no big deal, but, um, just give it a second to, uh, to run. And there we go. Okay. So now we can see what the future forecast looks like for uh, the first 10 customers. And you can see it's nice and stable, nice and stable, all right? Not too crazy, uh, you know, and, um, and and you can just kind of do this for each of the different customers, all right? So there you go, guys. I mean, you've now got a much more accurate 90-day customer lifetime value forecast for 100 different customers. I know I'm only showing 10 here, but believe it or not, we did it for 100, and you can scale it up to even more than that. All right, so some, some conclusions, guys. I appreciate you guys hanging out for me there while uh, we, we, we uh, ran into a little bit of code difficulty. So conclusions for y'all. So we now have, I've now given you guys a clear cut pathway to do a customer lifetime value problem with forecasting. And I'm telling you guys, this is the real deal. Like I don't just show off these new kind of techniques for, for shock value, like that uh, mean absolute error, the ensemble to uh, correct the problems of the XG boost model. Like that is the stuff that if you take that away from this lesson, that's going to help you a lot. Anytime you run into time series problems, anytime you want to try and do customer lifetime value and increase the accuracy of your machine learning models. All right. So you now do honest to God, have some really good model, uh, some really good techniques, right? But Remember to the beginning of the presentation, is that going to make you $150,000 a year with, with the content that you saw today? Well, in my experience, probably not. So what will earn you that 150K a year is your data science process. And now I want to kind of, I want to give you guys um, some additional tips and advice. So, uh, and also it's a good time to pull out that notepad that I talked about at the beginning. 
Uh, so this is my data science process. I want to share my process looks like. So it doesn't matter if I'm doing a time series problem. It doesn't matter if I'm doing a machine learning problem. This, this is every step by step problem that I solve. I always solve it this way. Okay. And it's good to have a process that you can count on. So step one, we saw this data collection. We're going to read in some transaction data. Step two, we've got to do some sort of data exploration. Now that's going to vary depending on what your, your uh, modeling approach and what your business goal is. For us, it was time series a day. So we busted out time TK. We busted out some of the time series visualizations. But tomorrow, you might be faced with a completely different problem, like customer segmentation or something else that's not going to be a time series. Uh, step three, we showed you how to do some of that cleaning and the data wrangling that I had talked about, adding those features in, doing the pre-processing, doing the modeling, the machine learning. Uh, step six, we really didn't cover cross-validation today, but that's usually in my process. Once I get a decent model, um, then what I normally do is I do some cross-validation. takes a lot of time, which is why I cut it out of this presentation. Um, step seven, model selection. Uh, and then step eight, we didn't talk about this, but this is actually what organizations really want, some sort of way to use that. How, how many of you guys have ever um, done this for a, for a company? Um, how does how do your, your users get the most value out of your data science? It's not the models you build and all that stuff. It's the it's how you automate that process for them and give them access to those tools. And that's what a web application does. So let me talk about that for a second. So what your future company, so we just made this like nice fancy time series model for a customer lifetime value, which is great. You know, we've got some data, but this is what your company actually wants. They want the next time they have to run that model to be able to use a tool like this and not have to call Matt up and say, hey, can you run that analysis for me again this month? They want to be able to do it and they want to be able to tweak some parameters. And that's what you want to be able to give them. Okay. So the problem is, is that only 2% of you on this call can probably do that, right? So at the beginning of this presentation, I told you I'd give you everything that I could possibly can to help you uh, make that $150,000 salary. And believe me, that it was my, that is my goal. Now, most of you guys probably thought that was customer lifetime value, but it wasn't. So if you would like to be able to dominate data science with R and get a six-figure data science career, then I do have a special offer for you guys today. And this is really exciting. Would you guys like to see it? Let me know in chat. Give me a one up uh, or a yes if you'd like to see what offer I have prepared for you to take this further. All right, seeing some thumbs up. I will continue. Pop quiz, guys. What's the shortest path between two points? Let me know in chat. What do you guys think it is? All right, Bruno's got it. Straight line. Wow, uh, you guys are on it. So it is, in fact, a straight line. Now, when most people learn data science, they suffer for, from something. It's called shiny object syndrome. I know this because I had it big time. And because of SOS, it actually took me five years to become confident in data science. True story. Took me a really long time. Now, has anyone else caught themselves with SOS? Be honest. Put a put a one on. <laughs> yep. All right. I'm right there with you guys. It, it, um, I, you know, even to this day, I still suffer from it. So uh, tell me, which path do you guys think you're on? Path one, start to getting a job or start to getting that promotion or start to breaking into data science. Or are you on path two? Start back and forth, two steps forward, one step backward. Which way am I going? I'm lost in the dark. All right. Yep. You're on two. <laughs> Some of you are on three. I like that. Uh, now, truth be told, I was on path two as well. And I see everyone doing the same thing. So to combat this, I've created something cleverly named the path. Path does two things, shows you what to do for any data science project, but it also shows you number two, what skills to learn in order to be able to accomplish that data science project. Truth be told, it's honestly the single biggest secret to my success as a data scientist, as a teacher, as a coach, and a consultant. Now, before you can solve any problems, you need a foundation in data science. And what that looks like is on the path foundational data science skills. So all of this stuff here, cleaning, wrangling, visualization, exploratory data analysis, machine learning, clustering, reporting, programming. Now, most data scientists or aspiring data scientists think that this is what a data scientist is. Wrong. This is just the bare minimum, okay? Because what companies actually need you to do is to solve the business problem, all right? The skills don't matter much. It's how you use them. So you have to have a good problem solving process. 
So if you can't deliver value, you're not going to really be that valuable for the company. So these are all the things that you need to be able to do. Things like correlation analysis, costing a problem, pre-processing data, learning how to tell a story, how to do automated machine learning, explainable uh, AI, and uh, sensitivity analysis. Those are all the things that are going to help you convince leadership uh, that and solve problems for them that are going to be of value. All right. Um, next on the path, shocker, time series forecasting. You know, most people, most data scientists, again, they skip this. Uh, if you want to be able to work with, for any company that sells anything, every single one is going to do some form of selling, which means that if you can predict the sales, revenue drops, the supply and demand, all that stuff, you're going to be super valuable, right? Being able to predict the future is one of the most profitable skills, but on the flip side, if you screw it up, which I did, if you put that XG boost model into production and it goes all wonky all over the place, you're going to end up, your company's going to end up thinking customers are much higher CLV and you're going to end up uh, killing your profits. All right. So you're going to feel the re repercussions. All right. Next on the path then. So now that you have the analysis skills, uh, you need to be able to build tools for yourself. Um, so building tools for yourself creates what's called repeatable business analyses and getting tools put into production. That's the value. That's the way that your non-technical people that I've been talking about, the way that your business is actually going to get value from your work. So uh, once you can build tools for yourself and those smaller tools, uh, which is great, then you need to be able to kind of take it to the next level, build tools for your company. And when you can build tools for your company, that's where you actually automate the entire business process, okay? And you have, uh, it cuts out the IT department completely. You can deploy apps yourself and it automatically turns you into a leader. So with the path, you have all the knowledge to complete projects by yourself. You don't need a CEO to get angry and ask you to solve problems. You don't need data engineers to you know be able to wrangle data. You don't need to be micromanaged by a project manager. You can do your own project management and you don't need the IT department and IT man here smoking a cigarette, acting Mr. Cool uh, to do their job either. You can do it yourself. And when you complete the path, you transcend data science. Okay. And you become a business scientist. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever seen my uh, matrix here, but this is what's wrong with, in my opinion, data science. Everyone wants to become a data scientist, but the reality is businesses actually want this, what's in this quadrant. Okay. And they will pay more for it. That's why a business analyst tends to make more than a data analyst. And that's why data scientists are stuck doing theory and machine learning all, all day, but not actually solving business problems. Okay. So becoming a business scientist, it follows the path. And you start with this first course, data science for business part one. Inside of Data Science for Business Part 1, you learn the foundations of data science. So you can perform basic machine learning, produce high quality reports uh, that businesses can use to generate insights. You can clean and work with data, visualize data, which produce those insights. And you learn the machine learning alg algorithm foundations, all the general uh, foundational steps for all of data scientists. Okay, inside of this program, what you learn is the most 20 most important functions for data wrangling. You learn how to master ggplot2 and visualize data like a pro. You learn how to work with the special data types. You learn how to create functions and iterate. You learn how to do k-mean clustering, you know, really important for things like customer segmentation. You learn how to do machine learning and model uh, prices and uh, other things for your company to get predictions. And you learn how to package those into a report, uh, which is really important because Starting off, that's probably where you're going to get the most value for your executives and for your managers is by making reports. So any course, you always should ask yourself, yeah, Matt, what's this going to do for me? Well, this is David Stevens, a student of mine, and he sent me this. He says, I nearly doubled my salary and it's because I'm taking your courses. So today, guys, you're getting data science for business part one as part of this offer. Total value is $697. But next on the path, is problem solving and we need something for that. So I've given you now data science for business part two. And with part two, that's where we take it to the next level. You're now solving the exact type of problems that you're gonna face inside of companies, okay? So you start with a $5 million uh, per year business problem. You use a repeatable framework that I put together uh, that I actually use for consulting uh, that can be applied to almost any business problem. 
You learn how to solve the entire business problem step by step. You use advanced tools like automated machine learning and explainable AI. And you learn how to develop financial decision making using return on investment to show organizational savings. Because at the end of the day, that's really what they want. They want, okay, what is this giving me? How much is it saving me? Inside of this course, this is the framework that you learn. Uh, it's my business problem solving framework called the BSPF, Business Science Problem Framework. And it's the seven stages that are, you're going to walk companies through. It's also a massive, massive secret weapon if you're trying to get a data, uh, get through a data science interview. Uh, you bust that out and they love you for it. Um, you also learn H2O Auto ML. This is the secret to making hundreds of machine learning models automatically. You learn how to do what most data science teams don't know how to do, which is starting off costing the problem. You learn how to do pair plots, which is an, a way to find quick wins for your company. You learn how to do feature engineering. So that way, uh, instead of garbage in, garbage out, you actually make really good machine learning models. And it starts with the good features. You saw that today with that um, the sales value uh, rolling um, features. That made the model. Without that, that actually boost model would have sucked. Uh, H2O leaderboard. Uh, you learn how to pick, how to utilize H2O and pick the best model, the one that's going to be most stable. Uh, you learn how to analyze the model performance plots. You're going to compare models and select the best. Uh, you learn explainable AI. So this is important when you want to actually convince leaders and business people to use your models. You're going to use explainable AI to show them what this model is telling them about their customers. You're going to learn how to optimize the model. You're going to learn how to do sensitivity analysis. This is important when they ask you like, hey, Matt, great model, but what happens when I tweak this little thing? And I, you know, I want to know, you know, what, what's the best case, worst case scenario. Well, this is where you bust out sensitivity analysis. And then it all ends with a recommendation. So you actually have to recommend something. And if the organization does not take action, then it's all for naught. So I, I teach you how to do a recommendation. Okay. Um, most importantly, guys, this is, you need to ask yourself, you know, what's this course going to get me? Well, here's what it actually did for Augie. He's a student of mine. It saved his company $5 million per year. And he says here, uh, the project was a huge success. I got a personal message from my CTO and the CEO mentioned the model in, the inv in their investor call. Uh, the skills displayed during the project were a major, major consideration factor in my promotion to analytics manager a few months later. So today, guys, you're getting data science for business part one and part two, a $1,694 value. Next on the path is time series. And for that, I have my high performance time series course. So if you want to learn what we learned in this training and take that to a completely new level, then this is what you want to learn. Okay. This is the high performance time series course. And I go deep, deep, deep into the stuff that you saw kind of, um, you, you got a tutorial of today. So in high performance time series, we solve a special type of problem that costs organizations millions of dollars per year. You learn strategies from four state of the art time series competitions use custom software that I wrote to make forecasts at scale. And we're talking about thousands of forecasts. So again, this is all software that you're learning, not only from somebody who's an expert in this field, but also I'm the person who actually wrote the software. Um, you're gonna use advanced techniques like machine learning, deep learning, and feature engineering, which is exactly what companies um, are asking for. Uh, and inside of that course, uh, you're gonna learn the six most important time series visuals uh, summarizing by time, this is like a you know 80-20 tool. Can't tell you how, how important that one is. Um, you're going to learn how to work with time series, do transformations like box cox, work with outliers and imputation, uh, external regressors. You're going to learn how to factor those into your models. You're going to learn the full model time workflow. You know We got a glimpse of it today, but there's a lot more to it. Uh, you're going to learn how to use um, different algorithms like ARIMA. Uh, you're going to learn XGBoost, how to beat ARIMA. Uh, ARIMA Boost, how to combine uh, XGBoost and ARIMA uh, into one model. You're going to learn how to do hyperparameter tuning to stabilize your model, ensembles, much more advanced. Uh, and then deep AR, the deep learning side of things, um, and combining deep, deep learning and machine learning. So again, at the end of the day, what is this going to do for you? So how many of you guys have ever suffered from imposter syndrome? Put a one in chat if, you're, if you uh, have... Felt imposter syndrome before. I am right there with you guys. Uh, true story. When I was first starting, um, I like was totally unconfident and, you know, 
always felt that other people were advancing much faster than I was. And I think that that's kind of the norm. Like, I hate to say it, but probably 90% of data scientists feel that same way. Amit, he felt the same way. He said, uh, I'm extremely grateful that I found you in your courses last year. I used to feel imposter syndrome when I first started working. My skills were lacking compared to others. And I always felt like I had a lot to catch up on. Now I feel like I belong and I can take on any new challenge. I would not have my new job if it wasn't for you. And I will always be thankful for that. In short, you have changed my life in the direction of my career. Um, he used the content of this time series course actually to get him through the um, uh, the 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 interview. The, uh, I think it was the second round of the interview for PwC. They're they're a big um, consulting firm, uh, one of the big four, and he's now the machine learning senior associate there. But he actually sent me his uh, uh, to show me what he did for that company to get the job. And he, and he says, this helped me move into the final rounds. I was able to do everything in, within two days. If it wasn't for your courses, it would have definitely taken me longer. And I don't think my results would have been half as good to move on to the final rounds. So that's the power. Once you start learning this stuff, companies want to hire you. They want to promote you. They want to move you through the ranks. So if you've been trying to break into data science, like this is literally going to help you uh, speed that process up big time. So you're getting today, data science for business part one, part two in my high performance time series course. 2591 value. Now, again, on the path, building tools for yourself. For that, we have Shiny Apps Part 1. And this is the foundations of production for data science. You're going to learn how to build web apps. That's what the companies actually want. They want you to be able to automate these processes so they don't have to involve Matt every time, every single time. You know, they want um, a new uh, uh, analysis done. So you're going to automate key business analysis and processes, and you're going to empower your company to make data-driven decisions for years to come. It also teaches you, you know, the stuff that most program, uh, in, in my opinion, most data science programs neglect. The HTML, the web part, the, you know, how do I actually make a product? So you're going to learn that type of stuff. Uh, this is the first app I teach you how to build. Um, it's a sales dashboard, but what's cool is it integrates that forecast on demand. When companies see that, that's what they need. Um, especially in the time series space. Most companies, like if you're using a Power BI or Tableau, it's a static data, you know, static forecast that they're going to build in. Uh, but what R does is allows you to do dynamic forecasts. Um, the second app that I teach you how to build, this is a product price. Um, it allows you to analyze products for gaps and um, it'll actually recommend what the price is for that product that you're going to build for the company. Um, so it's, it's actually a, a really good pricing tool. Um, so what does this course do for you? Havi, this is a student of mine. She, uh, this was the first app that she built and it helped her get a job at the U S federal reserve. Uh, this is Francesc. He left my program with a job offer. He put together this financial stock analysis using the ensembling approaches. Um, and you can see what he built here and it helped him get a job. Um, so today, guys, you're getting data science for business part one, part two, my high performance time series, shiny web apps, one $3,488 value, but we have to finish the path and, and becoming a business scientist doesn't just stop with building an app, but actually putting it into production. And that's for that. We're going to give you shiny web apps part two. Okay. So you're going to learn cloud technologies, things like AWS Docker. Uh, you're going to learn how to scale and deploy data science, add security, uh, which is a requirement for the enterprise connect to backend databases, customize user interface, integrate APIs, and basically everything that you need to do for the enterprise. Like when you're actually building these at, at an enterprise level, instead of just for like simple processes, but multi-user applications, uh, I teach you how to do that. So you don't just build um, an you know, enterprise grade app, but one of the best things about this course is you actually deploy it using AWS cloud technology, Git and GitHub for version control and Docker for uh, the managing the uh, environment. So what does this course do for you? Mohana says, after your entry into my life, I can grab a job wherever I want. He got three raises in eight months uh, and he basically doubled his salary. And that's what he's telling me here. So this is the type of app that you build and this is the system that is gonna take you there, guys. So you're getting today, data science for business part one, part two, my high performance time series, my shiny web apps part one, shiny web apps part two. Total value is $4,385. Now, what about projects? Well, you're gonna complete eight projects through this program. So you're gonna get tons and tons of project experience. And again, this is what's gonna help you 
grow yourself as a data scientist. So you're going to do a customer segmentation project. You're going to do a product price prediction project, $5 million churn prediction in course two, $5 million demand forecasting in course three, demand forecast app course four, product price recommender, recommender app course four, stock, uh, multi-user stock analyzer app course five, and then an application library to host all of your apps inside of it. Okay. Lifetime support. You get access to my private Slack channel. Uh, and this is for lifetime. And what you can see here, we've got 2,800 students. Uh, now we're up to 3,345 students in, in, uh, in my Slack channel. So lots of people to network with and help grow your career. What results can you get? Here's what happens. This is David, got a job at Microsoft. He says, your courses gave me the confidence to get through the interview. Uh, this is Justin. He says uh, he, he got his job as a principal data scientist at Northwestern Mutual. In less than six months, I had fully transitioned into a, a lead data scientist, and my life is better for it. He's now, the, he's now a principal data scientist. Uh, this is Ben. He says, after five years of struggle, I had two job offers. And this is Jennifer Cooper. She got her dream job as VP of Strategic Analytics at J.P. Morgan Chase. Okay. What about your data science portfolio? So this is where things get a little interesting. Brand new for 2024, and actually this is the first day that I'm rolling this out, uh, you're gonna get an extra special benefit, okay? So I'm gonna give you three amazing apps to help you stand out. So these are the three apps, Shiny App 1, 2, and 3. Let me explain what you guys are getting. So Shiny App 1 is a time series forecast app that does what's called hierarchical forecasting. Shiny App 2 uh, is a customer churn score prediction app. So if you're in marketing analytics, this will be good for that. And then if you're in finance, uh, shiny app number, this should be number three. Sorry. Like I said, it's brand new. Uh, still got, still got some errors on the, on the slide. Uh, so shiny app number three though is a finance app. So this is great for, if you want to work at anybody that does loans like big banks, uh, or credit, uh, you're going to learn how to do a loan default prediction app. Um, so those are the three apps. Those each total up to 5,000 each. So that's $15,000 of value that I'm adding into this offer for you today. So data science for business part one, part two, my time series course, shiny web apps one and two, and then you're going to get three shiny apps, a $15,000 value, total value of $19,385. Now, AI is huge. Unless you've been living under a rock, ChatGPT is out there and it is one of the biggest productivity enhancers. So to help you with this, uh, for the students that take me up on this offer, I'm going to give you a bonus called ChatGPT for Data Scientists. And what this does is it takes two of um, two two lessons that I put together. Uh, the first one teaches you how to avoid the mistakes uh, that I made when I was first starting ChatGPT, and then the second one uh, teaches you how to build shiny web apps like this one here. It's, it's a, a business finder. Um, it teaches you how to do it 10 times faster using ChatGPT. So I'll walk you through the full process. So today, guys, you're getting the five course art track, all five courses here, the three shiny apps and ChatGPT for data scientists. That's a $500 value. Full stack now is up to $19,885. But I wanted to take it one step further. And I want to give you every possible thing that I can give you to help you in 2024 become the best data scientist possible. All right. So the first 10 people that take me up on this offer are going to get a free one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. That's a thousand dollar value. Here's why. Uh, Samantha used her one-on-one -on -one coaching call to get through the third round of the CVS pharmacy data scientist interview. And she said she got the job. All right. She called me up on a Friday. We worked through it. And on Monday, she had her, her third round of the CVS pharmacy uh, data engineering interview. She got the job. She's now the R shiny data engineer. She says, happy to announce I got the job and I truly want to thank this channel and course for motivation. So that's what this coaching call can do for you. You can use it for whatever you want, but that's uh, especially good for uh, getting through the interviews. So you're getting not only the data science for business five course R track, but you're getting the three shiny apps as a bonus, the, the chat GBT for data scientists and the first 10 people, I only have 10 slots for this, are going to get a one-on-one -on -one coaching call for me, thousand dollar value. That brings this total value over $20,000 now, guys. Now, if you really buy these on my website, uh, it would add up to $20,000. I know even though it's worth every penny, uh, you know, it may be a lot of money. So instead of paying the $20,885, 
How about if I give you a 90% discount today, guys? All right. So instead of paying $20,885, I'm going to cut that down, guys, to $19.99. All right. And this is a ton of value. It's everything that you need in order to be able to advance your career. All right. So last time I announced this, uh, we sold out on the first day and I had a bunch of people mad because they didn't get the one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. So for those of you who want to become a business scientist and take your career to that next level, and remember guys, this is what companies actually need. Are you ready to change your life? All right. So ready guys on three, two, one, I'm going to put the link in the chat right now and uh, we will get you guys all set up with this program here. So I'm putting the link in the chat and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I will uh, just really quick go through um, some just some common questions that I always get with uh, this offer. So this is actually brand new for 2024. So this offer has never been uh, uh, put together, packaged this way. So you're getting three shiny apps now. You're getting all five of the courses. You're getting ChatGPT so you can help you with the AI and be able to do things faster. And you're getting a coaching call with me in order to be able to help you with whatever you need, whether it's your career path, um, whether it's breaking into data science. Uh, but a lot of people save that and they use that when they're in the interview process. So it's good for all of those three types of things. Um, this offer does expire in two days and 23 hours. So on Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, the offer is gone. Uh, and um, if you go to buy this on the website, not only are you going to spend a lot more money, you're not going to be able to get any of the bonuses. Uh, so the way the checkout form works, I put the link in the chat. You're going to give, you're going to put your full name uh, and your email address. That's going to set you up inside of our platform. Uh, you're going to uh, put in your phone number and that's in case you ever run into any problems. Uh, we're going to be able to get on the phone. We'll be able to get on, uh, get a hold of you and be able to get those ironed out. Um, next thing. So there's two different payment options. Uh, let me explain these because this can lead to some confusion. So there's a single payment of $19.99. All right. There's also a 12 payment plan of $199. Now the downside of going with this one, you know, this is great for, um, you know, you, uh, spreading the payments out, but you cannot do the 50% off learning labs pro membership. So if you want this, uh, it's currently $100 on my website, but you guys are going to get it for $49 uh, a month if you leave this box checked, uh, but you can only do that for the full payment plan. So if you do this, you will get an error at checkout. Uh, we always run into this. You have to take this off. It's only available for the $19.99 plan. And what that gets you access to is the recording that you saw today, all of the code, plus 91 other labs that I've done on marketing analytics, time series on, you know, finance on all of these different topics that my students have been asking me to do that are beyond, you know, outside of, of the, uh, the core program. Okay. So it's a really good way to like, um, combine things, but you need to have the, you need to do the single payment plan. Um, the rest of this is pretty standard. Uh, it's a credit card number. You just put your information in here, um, complete the order and give the server a minute or two to process that'll give you access to the, um, you'll get a welcome email. Uh, and that welcome email will tell you the exact steps to take to join the Slack channel and to get access to, and it'll uh, give you the link to get you inside of the um, uh, the program. So this is the Slack channel. Uh, first step, you're, you're gonna wanna get yourself added to our Slack channel. Uh, you know, this is a perfect place for networking. You see Nicholas right here. Uh, he just got a job as, uh, what was he got a job? Oh, he's with Vanguard now. Uh, he starts in April. So, you know, this is the type of stuff. This is motivation. It's good for helping you through any problems. If you run into any problems, it's, you know, kind of the meeting place, uh, the, the, the water cooler, so to speak. Um, if you do learning labs pro, you'll have learning labs pro. This is what the inside of the platform looks like. You'll have access to the five courses. Um, this is the first course course of the five courses. I want to show you guys just so you know how much content you guys are getting access to. These are each video lessons. So the first course is that foundational one. You have, I think, over 300 video lessons just in this first one. And all of these come with a certificate of completion. 
So every course that you complete with me, you get a new certificate. Um, other than that, I mean, that that's pretty much the, the breakdown. I'm happy to answer questions about the, the offer um, and any of the content that you sold today. Okay. All right. Uh, so Nicholas has a question. Does the coaching video call have an expiration date? I enrolled eight months ago, but haven't used it. No, it, it doesn't have a uh, expiration. You can actually use it whenever um, you get it for lifetime, basically. So, uh, but when you use it, then it, then it will be gone. Okay. Uh, so does that answer your question, Nicholas? All right. Perfect. Uh, Bruno says, uh, Learning Labs Pro is a recurrent payment monthly. Yes. So uh, you do not, you won't have lifetime access with this. This is uh, 49 a month. Um, you can buy it on my website. Lifetime access is $2,500 though. So if you want to um, do lifetime access, uh, most people go with the payment plan and at 50% off, it's a, it's a steal. Um, does uh, this only teach R or does it cover Python also? So this is the R track program. And I do have a separate Python program, but it's not for sale today. Uh, this is only focused on R. Uh, uh, but with that said, it'll teach you everything you need to be successful as a data scientist with R in today's environment. Um, it teaches you the full five, you know, the five components of the path, gives you the portfolio, uh, shiny apps, uh, gives you the coaching call and how to do chat GPT. Oh, and by the way, if you do chat GPT, it's really easy to convert our code to Python code. I do it all the time. That's how I'm building Python TK, by the way. Um, okay. Uh, so that was Javier. Uh, yes, Sid, what is the estimate of the time to complete the full, uh, the full track? So it, it varies depending on how much time you can put into it, but it is a ton of content. And I will say, say there, there's a lot of lessons to this. It goes very deep into what I call the 80, 20 skills. So, uh, but figure probably, I would say six to eight weeks per course, to be honest. Um, that's at, it is designed for working professionals. So um, it's designed to be completed outside of working hours. Uh, and if you can do five to 10 hours a week, that's usually, um, it'll be probably about six to eight weeks per course, okay? Um, now, if you do 10 hours a week, you'll be closer to six weeks per course. Um, so figure five, six, you know, maybe eight months to complete all of them. But the other thing too, uh, to keep in mind is if you're trying to get a data science job, if you're trying to break into data science, if you're trying to level your, yourself up, you know, you can start applying to jobs after you complete probably the first one or the first two courses uh, that'll give you enough to compete with most data for most data science positions. And then plus you got the portfolio, um, you've got the the coaching call to help and you got chat GBT. Um, so that'll, that'll help you get through most of your stuff. But um, yeah, so that's how, that's what I would say. Um, if you're trying, if you got a, you know, three, if my goal is in three months to have a data science job, take it, knock out the first two courses, complete the next three while you're, you know, interviewing. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, you said, uh, I know it's kind of a long winded answer there, but hope, hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. James done. You're in. All right. Awesome, mate. Uh, I'm looking forward to helping you out, buddy. All right. Yeah. Actually, we got three people that just, do, uh, make, made the plunge. So guys, um, just to keep in mind, uh, this is awesome. And I'm super looking forward to help you. Douglas, you're in nice. Yeah. I see Douglas Hernandez just joined. We got, uh, Carolina. Oh, nice. Uh, you, you joined, uh, and then James just joined. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to helping you guys out. Uh, honestly, this is, this is the program I wish I had back in the day. Um, it would have helped a lot of, you know, uh, through that imposter syndrome, that three year stint when I was first learning. So I'm excited. Um, uh, just for everybody else that's on the call, keep in mind that, uh, we've had three just join here in the last minute or so. Uh, I only have 10 spots here for the one-on-one -on -one coaching. So please, 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 if you're interested in the coaching call, um, definitely ask your questions if you're on the fence. Um, I'm, I'm here for the next 20 minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll go through and, and answer any of your questions. Um, if I if I could only, I'd make a deal with God and uh, get him to swap our, our places. <laughs> Jonathan, hey, it trust me. You, you put in the work, you get the reward. That's the way this stuff works. Um, 
And, you know, there's a ton of people on the call today that are proof of that. If we got the Leos here, we've got some of the uh, others that, that are on the, on the call that have been with me forever. Um, so uh, Javier, you're saying, yeah, currently on the MIT data engineering program. After that, you're going to take mine. Yeah, it's a great compliment. If you're, if you're learning data engineering, uh, which I know is, is very popular as well, um, you know, the nice thing about data engineering is you're going to learn some of the, like the more complicated tooling in order to set up databases and, and uh, get business processes automated and, and such. This I view as a perfect counterbalance to that. So you're going to be real heavy on, you know, the wrangling and, and moving of data and the piping and the piping components of it but you're not going to have the analysis. And this is where that's going to really uh, come into play, especially if you want to become that business scientist where you can do everything yourself. Um, this is, this is a good compliment to that. So uh, very good idea, Javier. Um, Carolina, uh, we can ask questions about the modeling. We just said, yeah, uh, please feel free to shoot. You know, I'm here for another 20 minutes, whatever you guys want to chat about. Um, so uh, Sarah asks, please, I want a program for quant researcher role. Um, uh, so Sarah, check out quantscience.io. This is, uh, actually another program that I just started, uh, with a, uh, co-founder of mine, um, who we, we teach quant, uh, quant finance and algorithmic trading. So if you're interested in that, it's, it's quantscience.io. Check us out. Um, Carolina, uh, I have some questions. I didn't understand the calibration part. Uh, are we using test data in the training? No, no. So the, the calibration, what that does is it allows you to compare all of your models together. Uh, and it's basically the first step. So you, you trained models now on the training data and then the test data, you're now going to use that to evaluate. And that's what the calibration uh, does is it makes predictions on all of that test data. It doesn't calculate the accuracy. It doesn't do that yet. It just makes those test predictions and it stores them next to the model. Um, we then later use, uh, when we do model time accuracy, when we do the uh, model time forecast, we then use that calibration data to um, uh, produce the forecast and produce the confidence intervals. In the, um, in, uh, so that, that's kind of how it works. And then if you remember, we did at the end of it, once we figured out what model we want to use that ensemble, we then did a final refit of the full data set. Um, but that calibration data stays with it. So that's what you use to uh, measure your confidence uh, going forward. Uh, Sarah, where can I check the program, please? Um, so this is the... Uh, the checkout form. Um, you can use that checkout form. Uh, again, if you're uh, jumping out on board with us today, this is the uh, the program. Uh, it has the, uh, you know, this is everything that you're getting. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, Jonathan, this, this was far more than I was expecting to end the call with. Is there a subset of the foundation level that you offer as a 10 pager? Um, I, I don't offer any subsets. Um, so basically how, uh, this program operates is it's for the people who are committed to, you know, who, who really want to do this and do it as fast as possible. Um, you can always try another program like data camp or something like that. That's, you know, uh, more for, um, uh, people who kind of want to try out data science. But if you want to become a data scientist, a business scientist, and actually be able to do everything I talked about today, this is the program for you. You'll learn the foundational skills. That's in the first course. You can buy that on my website, but it'll be 700 bucks. Um, and then if, and then when you want this other stuff, it's, you know, it's going to start to add up. So this is the, the, the program that's kind of, and you won't get any of the bonuses too. So that's, that's the other thing. Uh, so if you're interested in doing it as fast as possible, um, this is what I would do uh, if you're learning, if you're interested in learning it at a deep level, this is what I would do. Uh, if you just want to, you know, get started with data science, um, you know, there's thousand data science programs out there. Uh, they all, you know, kind of teach basic, you know, foundational stuff, make you feel good. But, um, you know, this is the, this is the program that I designed it for me back in the day. <laughs> this is what I would have wanted. So anyways, um, hope, hopefully that helps. Okay. Uh, Michelle says, I am already a student. I have data science for business one, two. Do you have a package? Yeah. So Michelle, um, if you can email me, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Uh, just, just shoot me an email and we can handle what's called an upgrade. 
Um, so I'll put you in touch with my wife, Haley. She um, will evaluate what you've purchased already and figure out how to get you upgraded into this deal today. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, when does the course start? So this is the, the best part about this is this course starts when you enroll. It's all asynchronous, meaning all of these courses you take, you know, they're available on demand for you. I put all of the videos together for you. So that way you can just kind of watch these things you know, as you, as you want to take them. Um, it's kind of like popping M&Ms. Uh, you know, you just take a, you, you work your way, you start at the beginning and you kind of work your way through the course. You get the first course done. Uh, then you move on to the second and then you do the third and then the fourth and the fifth and, and so on. Um, you know, that's, uh, so it's all asynchronous. Everything is on demand. You can start taking it very uh, quickly uh, right, right now. All right. Carolina says, I was a bit uneasy with linear model for time series. Can you comment on that? So linear regression, um, you know, I use it for demonstrating time on time series, but it often overfits. And that's why that's why we used this model here, the um, the GLM net. So GLM net is much better. Uh, it includes this penalty factor. So uh, when we when we created this uh, model here that has or the uh, the preprocessor that has all of these. Uh, it becomes a very wide, these are all the features and it ten, uh standard linear regression will overfit this badly. So when you forecast with it, it's going to like jut up, like it's going to go all nuts, right? To prevent that, that's why we use elastic net. Um, so it's kind of like linear regression. Um, it gives you coefficients and all of that stuff, but you're, you're using, um, whoops, this, uh, you're using this penalty factor here. So that's why we use, um, linear, uh, Elastic net. That's why I'm using this GLM net as opposed to just linear regression. Um, I, I I do teach in my time series course both linear regression and elastic net, but uh, you know linear regression is is kind of like the beginner version, and then once you get once you get a handle on that, I always do it for production. I use elastic net. I never use linear regression. Um, so all right, George answered your question. When is the course starting? It starts right now. Um, you you guys get access to it and it's on demand um i'll put the link in the chat one more time for anybody who needs uh the link again um you have travel in march oh this is george you have travel in march looking for april yeah so if you buy this program now you get lifetime access to all this stuff all the stuff you get lifetime access to it's not going to go anywhere so if you can't start until april no problem you know it'll be there when you're ready uh, but the offer expires in two days so just be aware of that. Um, if you want to come back to it and you don't get in in the two days, then it's going to cost a lot more money. Um, okay, David, I signed up for your program two weeks ago, but I was just able to log in today. I don't see the shiny web apps part three in my dashboard. David, can you, yeah, uh, contact Haley. Um, just make sure that she's got it in there. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what might be going on. So uh, just shoot Haley an email. I think I gave you her email today. So just, just, um, she'll be able to help you out with that. Uh, Bruno, can you please comment on how to split test and training in a time series model? Sure. So when we, when we do, um, a time series split, so there's two different methods you can use or two different functions. There's the time series split. Um, you can also do, uh, what's called if you're, if you're doing like time series cross validation, uh, if you go from time TK, uh, there's cross, uh, so let's see time series CV. This is the other one. Um, so when you do this, uh, what you can do is it'll actually set you up and here's some, some actual examples that you can run. Uh, but you can do, uh, like a six month assessment and it'll give you every six months, um, kind of like a training and test set. So it'll give you multiple of those. Um, and if you do like slice limit three, that'll give you just three sets, but you can do as many as your, you know, as, as, as big as your time series is. Um, if you want to visualize the, the, the plan. So let me, let me just run this real quick. I'll, sh I'll show you what happens. Um, so if I do a new uh, R script here, um, we'll, we'll just run through this. So the, uh, what I want to do is I want to visualize this time series plan. So we're making this CV, um, where is it? Control enter. 
uh, oh, here it is. Plot the, the time series CV. So this is what a time series uh, cross-validation does. So the first set is always going to be the most recent data, but then it's going to shift. And then this becomes the training data down here or the testing data down here. And this next piece becomes the testing data. Now, if you do, um, if you do cumulative, I'm going to show you what cumulative looks like. Uh, oh, this is just a different data set. But if I do um, cumulative, and if I set that equal to true, which is what we did, what it does now is it takes, instead of doing, you see how this uses the full data set now? And then, um, so this doesn't change, the red part doesn't change, but it just now extends the full way back. So versus if you if you set cumulative equal to false, it'll just look at this um, 12 month span, okay? Does that make sense? Um, I think that was Bruno. Does that Does that make sense how kind of this time series splitting works? Um, Paul, money back guarantee. There's a 30 day, uh, money back guarantee on this product on, on this system. Okay. Uh, George says, um, we'll get in touch. Yeah. Just shoot me an email, George. Uh, if you can't make it in two days, um, if you have to get like your work to, to help you out with it or whatever, uh, we will make accommodations, but, um, you're probably not going to get the coaching call. Cause that usually goes pretty quick. Um, James, if you are having trouble to log in uh, with Teachable, please send an email to my wife, uh, hdancho at business-science.io. She she handles all of like the like platform, you know, any types of bugs and stuff. Um, so we'll we'll get you in there. Uh, but but rest assured, we're, you know, uh, we're going to take care of you. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Do most data scientists understand exactly why certain functions, training, and models seem to work? So the, the big thing that I found in data science uh, when I was learning is you really, it takes time to get a lot of experience and you really need experience with the different modeling approaches. Like when, when I came up with this strategy, um, you guys don't realize it, but this thing took me a, several days to prepare. Now you only see 400 lines of code, but I actually had about a thousand lines of code that I had written because I was trying different uh, modeling approaches. I slimmed it down to the four that were the best. And then, um, and then this approach, you know, I tried a, a couple of different like ensemble methods and such. So that only comes with experience and you generally, you know, in your process, you'll, you'll learn what works, what doesn't work, what, what things to try and tweak, uh, which parameters to tweak. So, yeah, it would, it would take you weeks, maybe not days to write. Well, I, I've written it for you though. So I've done the hard work. So when you when you run into a problem like this now, you um, if you become a Learning Labs member, uh, you now have all the code here where you can just use it as a framework. Think of it like, you know, this problem is solved, but you can apply it to many different problems. Customer lifetime value, the, the process stays essentially the same, okay? So... Yeah, I, starting out, everything takes you along. I know when I was starting out, it took me a week just to get R installed on my computer. Like, think about that—a week just to like install R and you know download a couple of packages. Like, trust me, I get it. But um, but yeah, it, it, you know you'll you'll get there, James. And the program's here to help. I'm here to help. Um, you know, ha happy to help. Okay. Uh, what is the best package? Uh, this is Sarah. What is the best package for someone who has a degree in statistics and never put a hand on real world projects? Okay. So Sarah, I, I honestly, well, fr from a course standpoint, this course will, will certainly help, of course. So uh, that's obviously the first choice. Now, the second choice though, is you need to get project experience and however you do that, it doesn't really matter but you need to like dive in and get your hands dirty. And that's the problem. You're not going to, you're not going to learn how to do this stuff by reading a book. That was the misconception when I first started, you know, I read um, introduction to statistical learning, love that book. I uh, love, love, love that book, but it still wasn't until I started applying some of the tools and techniques and going through the problems of like, Oh, what do I do with this bug? How do I like figure this thing out? 
Um, is this going to work? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay. We got to scrap that. Maybe the next one will work. Like that's the, the process that you'll want to go through. The program streamlines it, but however you get that, you, um, my suggestion would be, you know, get project experience, get, you know, like build, building these things honestly will help you so much. Like you were going to learn so much just by making a shiny app and automating something. Does that make sense, Sarah? I, I hope that, you know, I don't want to seem like, um, cause I know <clears throat> myself, I'm a, you know, theory, like when I first started, I was like theory, 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 stats, 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 but projects, projects were the, were the answer. <clears throat> Okay, you don't have a problem building up. Well, then then you're probably good. Uh, I would just get a problem that is applicable to what you want to do. Um, okay, about the modeling projects. Yeah, it, it just it comes down to finding a problem that you're interested in, that you want to solve, and then just going off and solving it. Um, that's what that, that would be my recommendation. Okay, yeah. How to, how to find them? Um, you know. The easiest probably way is to search online for like data sets, like Google data sets. Um, if you have a specific field, uh, is it what, uh, do, you, do you have a specific field that you're interested in, Sarah? Okay, what, what's that field? Okay, quant finance. Okay, yeah, so maybe just start with like uh, quant, finance, data sets. Um, you, you can usually just get stock data though. Um, so uh, if you want to use like TidyQuant, for example, TidyQuant, it's one of my packages. TidyQuant. Have you heard of TidyQuant before? So it, this is, um, so I, I'm the developer of TidyQuant. Uh, this is one of the packages um, that we've been de uh, developing for quite some time. Yeah, you can you can download stock data. Uh, it, it has a pretty good set of articles. Uh, introduction to TidyQuant, core functions. If you go to the core functions, uh, this will show you how to access financial data, and you know, like Apple uh, or lots of different stock, like Japanese stock prices, Fred economic data, and so on. Uh, TidyQuant, yeah, it's an R package that I that I wrote. Yeah, it, it's um, it's not a program. It's not a course. Uh, it's just an R package. Uh, I, I build it. It's it's there for free if you guys want to use it. Um, uh, Bruno, how do these courses and webinars uh, relate to your R tips playlist? So R R tips is just kind of like you know, five minutes on you know how to how to do like a heat map or something like that. Uh, this system is a complete system, a complete learning program that's going to teach you step by step all of the foundations, how to do business problem solving, how to uh, understand how to do time series at a deep, deep, deep level, and then how to package those into a framework or a format that companies can use to automate their business processes. All right. So you're going to learn how to do all of that stuff in this program. That's honestly, it took me like literally five years to build this program. Uh the you're not going to get that from our tips our tips are just you know it takes me maybe 30 minutes to put an r tip together and i think there's like 50 or so of them um you know it's it's good uh for you know getting a quick tip here and there but it's not going to be the thing that teaches you at a foundational level all right uh udit asks um i am using canaxis rapid response will r be beneficial as i add this on top so for demand forecasting, um, there's nothing better than what I've shown you today. This is the system that I continue to use all day, every day uh, for doing my forecasting. It's, uh, I built model time. Uh, it took probably, it's been two to three years of, of developing it. And model time is, uh, in my opinion, the best forecasting software out there. So, uh, and, I, and it keeps getting better. I keep adding new stuff to it. So I would say, yes, uh, or it, it'll always be beneficial to add, if you're doing demand forecasting, it'll always be beneficial to use some of the open source software. Uh, you'd be shocked at how much you can increase the accuracy. Okay. 
You got it. All right. Any other questions? Um, all right, Javier, you're going to reach out in June. H happy to have you then. I'll be here when you're ready. Um, if anyone else needs a link, uh, there it is. Um, I'm going to wrap things up here. Uh, yes, we're going to move on to the cheat sheet. Okay. So just real quick before I do, um, let's see. All right. So there's still seven spots left for the one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching call. So those will go. I don't know how fast they'll go, but um, probably before the two days are, are uh, before these this timer hits zero. So if you want those coaching spots, I only have ten spots available in my calendar. So, um, uh, but but grab, but scoop it up, uh, and uh, time is of the essence. Okay. With that said, um, so David asks, is our Studio Cloud okay with your program? You can you can use it. Um, but it's, so the problem with cloud is you you're only given one gigabyte of Ram for free and you're not going to be able to do a whole lot with like H2O with one gig of Ram. I recommend at least eight gigabytes of Ram. So I would not use, uh, our studio cloud. I would, um, you know, you could probably get started with the program. Uh, you don't learn H2O until the second course, but once you get to that point, um, it's probably time to upgrade to, uh, to to like a, a local version uh most of my students don't use our, our studio cloud okay all right uh yeah quantscience.io yeah so that that's that's a different program that i run um it's actually a completely different company but um i'm co-founder in that company as well that that one's more for algorithmic trading if you're interested in like trading and finance uh then check that out Okay. Uh, all right. The art cheat sheet. You guys ready for the cheat sheet? You guys good with that? Any any other questions? All right. Cool. All right. I'm going to uh, put the cheat sheet in the chat and I'll, um, just bear with me. I'll, I'll go through it with you guys. So um, just so you know how it works. Uh, so this cheat sheet super powerful, guys. Um, if you're using like chat GPT, if you're um, doing anything where uh, you want to direct chat GBT to a response, you tell it which packages to use. And these are the core packages that I use all the time. That's what this first one is um, on the second page. So the first page is the, the core packages. If you click on any of these links, that'll take you to the documentation. So like this is the read our documentation, but if you see a CS next to it, that means cheat sheet. So it's actually going to connect you up to another cheat sheet. So this is the data import cheat sheet, okay? Um, and then uh, the second page is the shiny verse. So kind of similar to the first one, shiny is like an ecosystem of its own. And uh, this will give you all of the, the common things that I use and do. Uh, and then the third one is the special topics. So this is really powerful when you're, you know, working in specific donate domains like time series, like network analysis, like financial analysis, geospatial. This will show you the packages that I commonly use for those. Okay. All right. There you go, guys. Uh, we'll wrap it up. I'm going to put the link in for the uh, workshop or the um, not workshop, uh, the link in for um, uh, I put the link in for the courses there um, one more time. Okay. Not sure what you mean by note being able to access it, but so far it's a newsletter every week and sometimes a webinar every three months or so. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay, see you. Yeah, see you soon on LinkedIn. Okay. All right, guys. I will um see you guys soon. Remember, there's seven spots. They will go. Um, so make sure don't don't let them uh if you want if you want that uh one-on-one, -on -one, definitely uh jump on it. Okay. All right. Oh, you were answering Bruno. Okay, I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay. All right, I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.